All right. Welcome, everybody that's uh, trickling in right now to the Not Your Average Investor Show. Joining us on Zoom, we've got Greg Cohen, who is in the office today. Greg. Yo, Samurai Ninja in the office, real estate investor, <laughs> Greg Cohen. Here I am. People are, uh, you guys have reopened the office, right? There's, there's now, it, the last couple of weeks has been only you in the office, but now you got the face mask on because you got people in there. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, we're, we're here. We, um, I see we've got folks trickling in now. So that's great. So we, we are live and in the office here, we've got two groups that we've divided the team into. And, um, so we've got a group A and a group B, um, on the group B team. And so this week group B is in the office. Group A is working remotely and we're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future to, you know, the limit, the number of people we've got, we have over 80 people in the office. So if you can drop that in half, We've got about 12,000 square feet for folks in our, in our office complex here. So that's more than enough space to be socially distanced. And we're doing, doing our part. You know, we've got masks that uh, we, are, we are rocking and uh, a ton of hand sanitizer. Funny thing, actually, we just got like the biggest order of hand sanitizer. So rocking my mask game here. Um, we got the biggest order of hand sanitizer. It's, it had been like on backlog for, I don't know, months. We ordered it way back in the day. We get literally a truckload of hand sanitizer. And I don't know if like tequila companies like started to go into the hand sanitizer business yeah. or whatnot, but we opened up like the hand sanitizer. It's on pretty much everybody's desk here and it reeks of tequila. <laughs> really? It really does. So we're getting a different order of the hand sanitizer. It is, uh, it is quite pungent. So true story, my brother-in-law is the CFO of Patron tequila and yes they did go into the hand sanitizer business <laughs> no way yeah oh my goodness yeah. it makes complete sense i'm actually gonna see him this weekend so i'm gonna i'm gonna tell him i'm gonna maybe maybe that's maybe that's the hand sanitizer you bought <laughs> i'll have to get the bottle and, and see if there's uh there's the patron logo on there somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah I'll, I'll let him know i'll let him know all right so we're actually while all that was happening i went live on facebook without my without my face freaking out too much so welcome everybody to the not your average investor show i see that we have in here over 17 people already on the zoom call we got two already on facebook we see some of our usual regulars lee bishop marilyn cotterman welcome back mike foster welcome back rich glover welcome back and a couple of new names i would love to know where everybody's from dane hutchinson uh denver yon aaron o'neill i see a couple names here mark meisberg welcome welcome john evans uh raj patel i think i recognize your name from last time tess we'd love to put in the chat there's two different ways to communicate with us right down below you see a chat icon um, that if you click on it, then you got to go into the all panelists drop down menu and drop down and make it all panelists and attendees so people can talk to each other. And then there is the Q and A icon down below where if you go in there, you can ask questions that we will get answered live on the show here. And I didn't even introduce this, Greg. I'm sorry. Who are you again? This is my Who name is Pablo. What are we doing here? <laughs> My name is Pablo Gonzalez. I'm the host of the Not Your Average Investor Show. My co-host is always Greg Cohen, who is the co-founder of JWB and a real estate investment extraordinaire. J Greg, you want to say hello? Oh, also Part Ninja. Are you about to put and a face mask part on? Part Ninja too. <laughs> That's right. Part Ninja. For all of those that are on Facebook and didn't see our little intro here, I'm a Samurai Ninja, real estate investor, <laughs> health and safety advocate, and um, yeah, we're, we are super excited to have you guys here. This, this uh, weekly sit down is something we look forward to. It's largely driven by your content. So we're excited to have your questions. Uh, many times for those who are on our Tuesday show, there are a lot of questions we just didn't have time to get to. And so this is a great format to do that. And I get to do it with, with my good buddy, Pablo. So that's there right. We are. That's right. We love it. And thank you for joining us. Uh, the last little bit of housekeeping that I want to say, if you are new to the JWB universe, you're joining us for the first time and you want some background, we have a really great web class for you. JWBwebclass.com is where you go to see that and you see the fundamentals of what JWB believes in, what they do for clients and how they make it easy for you to invest in rental properties. Um, like if you were buying bonds, right? Because it's a better asset for long-term investment. I have learned that with my work with JWB. And if you want a specific 
uh, question asked, you want to see how uh, rental properties fit into your portfolio, go to chatwithjwb.com and you schedule a time to talk to our team. And the first call is always just a very informational, get to know you, see if it's a good fit for you call. I highly recommend anybody that is curious about it to hop on that call. So jwbwebclass.com to find out a little bit more about us uh, and chat with jwb.com for us to find out a little bit more about you and fit it for you specifically. And without further ado, Greg, we're going to hop right into the questions. You ready, buddy? Let's do it, brother. Okay. Greg, <laughs> based on, all right, uh, we'll start here. I, on Tuesday, it kind of flew under the radar that the private lending program that used to be a $50,000 minimum is now a $10,000 minimum for a private lending program. Can you tell us a little bit about the private lending program and why this new change? Yeah, absolutely. For those who aren't familiar with what private lending is, it's, it's a great way to invest <clears throat> in the real estate space, it's not actually owning rental properties, it's more like being a bank. And so there are real estate developers out there like JWB who borrow money to do their real estate projects, right? That's how we build over 400 houses a year and do you know, 500 renovations a year, right? We borrow money from our investors, from our clients, and, and that's really what the private lending program is. And it's got a lot of advantages to it because you as a borrower, excuse me, you as a lender are going to earn a really high interest rate, right? The interest rate that JWB pays is 10%. Um, and that's annualized interest. We pay 10%. And so, you know, that's obviously really attractive to folks. The other thing that's really attractive to folks is the security part of it. So the, uh, when you do a private loan, you get security in the form of a mortgage and a note. Right. And that protects you in the risk against the risk of default. Right. If you compare this to making an investment in the stock market and you make an investment in a company and the CEO of that company does something shady or the accounting practices are not, they cook the books or there's a terrible thing that happens and the stock price goes to zero, you are left with no money from that investment. Right. In rental properties, in real estate, in private lending, right? You're lending on a hard asset. And that means that you have a mortgage. And the, in the case of a default, much like a bank has a security instrument against you, if you don't pay your mortgage, they could take your house back. It's the same thing that you get at lending. So you have that security. To do. It's a great spot to recoup your initial investment, even if something would go wrong as a private lender. Um, I say that just as information for those who are interested with JWB, We've borrowed over $400 million in private lending funds since 2006. We have a 100% track record of paying our clients back principal and interest. And uh, we have never defaulted on a private loan, but it is good for you to know uh, that that is there, that security interest is there. And so recently, what I kind of shared in a very under the radar, not big fanfare approach, I think I, I like probably mumbled as I said it is, uh, we recently dropped the minimum investment for private lending uh, for JWB. It was $50,000 and we dropped it to $10,000. You want to know why, Paolo? Myself. Yes, I, I do. That's why I asked the question. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> for sure. I'm dying to know why. I've, I've got you down just as soon as you press mute and you think I'm going to be going, I nail it. And I, and I ask you that question. The reason just that trying we did, to stop myself from breathing on this microphone. That's all. <laughs> the reason that we did it is because of all of you. It is all of you in the group. It is your questions. It is your feedback. It is the 20 some odd people that are on our call right now. And you know, when I, when I'm sharing what I know about rental property investing and how to help you make better investment decisions, I'm also paying attention to your questions. And a lot of questions that we've had lately are, Hey, listen, I love JWB. I love the concept of rental property investing. I love private lending. I don't have $40,000 to invest in a rental property yet, but I want to get involved in some way. And so I brought this to my business partners and I said, you know, in the past, our private lending minimum was $50,000. Is there something that we can do to drop that? Uh, at the end of the day, there's additional costs that JWB incurs with a lower minimum, but we just weighed the pros and the cons against it. And we said, if we can bring more people into our atmosphere, into our network, get them started with seeing how we can treat them as a client and how we can produce returns for them, that's, you know, it's going to win. We're going to win in the long run. And so uh, it's a really a, a, a credit to all of you for being so active, for making this Not Your Average Investor show what it is uh, in our Facebook group, being interactive. Um, 
And, you know, it was just as simple as that. So we came up with a solution and that's, that's really where, where it started from. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And, you know, I, I, I know that in reviewing the, the private lending versus, um, versus rental income property, right? There is the rental income properties have the upside, the long-term upside of property appreciation, right? So you have the potential to get a much higher return and a cash performing asset. The private lending is kind of a set it and forbid, get it. If you are not there yet to buy rental income property, that's just somewhere to put some money um, that can build up to then being able to afford the rental income properties, right? It's, it's just less, less upside, but also completely passive, right? Yeah, exactly. So the best way to decide between private lending and owning rental properties at the end of the day, if you believe that properties go up in value over the long haul, you most likely are going to generate a higher rate of return from actually owning rental properties than doing private lending. But that doesn't mean it's right for everybody, right? If you have a much shorter horizon, that would be one reason private lending might make sense for you. But the other thing is that, you know, when you own rental properties through a turnkey provider like JWB, we are going to make this very passive. We're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, almost all of the heavy lifting for you. But at the end of the day, you've still got somebody who you don't know living in your homes for four years at a time, five years at a time, right? It's unrealistic to think that there are not going to be some maintenance issues, some vacancy issues at some point, right? We even put this in the evaluations when we bring clients on and sell properties, right? Like, listen, this is going to happen. It's okay because your returns are going to be fine, but don't be surprised when something happens. It's, it's a part of it. So private lending is a good alternative for somebody who just wants none of that maintenance and vacancy discussion ever, right? If there's an issue with the maintenance cost, if a build cost goes over, it doesn't affect the private lender at all. If, you know, the house is already rented, and the, the, the resident doesn't pay rent that month for some reason, it doesn't affect the private lender at all. They earn that 10% interest rate all the way, all the way through their loan. Um, so it is the, com the, the complete definition of set it and forget it. You know? And if you wanna own rental properties, you're going to have a higher upside because you actually participate in the value of the asset going up, but you gotta have you know, a stomach for it as well, right? If, you have a tenant that turns over and they move out and you have some money that you need to put back into the house. You can't throw your arms up in the air and say, this is the worst thing ever. Right? So a little bit of a difference there. Um, both of them are actually really popular for our clients. You can do both. And many people choose to diversify within real estate by doing both building that private rental, uh, uh, building up a rental property portfolio and doing private lending. So that's actually the more common choice. Awesome. And I want to come back to some of those points in a little bit, but we already have some user submitted questions here from our, our usual uh, participants here, which we really, really appreciate. Uh, Lee Bishop is asking, you said you do around 500 houses in a year. Do you keep the inventory you manage about the same each year? Question mark. So what happens to the inventory that you no longer manage? Um. I'm going to try to answer that the best way. I might need a little bit more clarification. So the first part of that question was, you know, we manage or we renovate about 500 homes a year. We do. Of that 500 homes, we've got, call it about 150 are brand, well, let me not say brand new, new properties that we purchased that need renovation. They're not brand new construction, right? So about 150 of that is renovations that we do. Those are ones that we just recently required, recently acquired. And the remaining amount are the properties that turn over. And so the ones that we've already renovated at one point, they had a resident in place in the, in the past. Now, after three years, four years of that resident living in there, they now need to be a property turn. So that 500 some odd number right there is comprised of both of those. Um, so I didn't, I didn't understand the, the next question, but I think that might've been the source of the confusion you know, if we're saying that we're buying, renovating 500 properties, it's not 500 properties that we just purchased this year to renovate. It is comprised of ones that we purchased this year, but the larger percentage of those is ones that we're renovating that were purchased in, in years prior. Um, okay, do, that makes sense. Do you think and that I, answered the question or do you, I, you know, I don't know. You did a better job with that question than I was capable of doing because I, I was just reading it and didn't really process it that great. Uh, but I'm sure Lee's going to chime in if, if he needs some more clarification. Well, let, me, let me just clarify because he was asking yeah. about properties that, you know, that we, that we no longer manage. That just doesn't happen. Um, I mean, every once in a while, you know, clients will sell a property or whatnot, but 
you know, the number of properties that we manage every single month tends to go up and up and up and up. Um, and that's not just us singing our praises, like we never ever lose a client, like we're not perfect. But the fact is that we are constantly buying properties and either lots or renovated properties that we need to renovate. And we buy, you know, geez, we'll buy about 700 total this year. So we're buying a huge amount. We build those out and those get added to the properties under management for us because those get sold to clients who then retain us for the management and the number continues to go up and up and up. So that's why if you're a part of our client newsletter, which I'd invite all of you to do, um, you know, best way to do it is just go to the website. There's, you can sign up for the web class. That's an easy way to do it. So probably just go to jwbwebclass.com. You can sign up and then you'd be added to our client newsletter. What we do is we report on our management stats every single month to give you all transparency. We show the number of homes that are under management. We show the number of homes that have been rented this year. We show the percentage of renewals that we have. And then um, we also show the occupancy percentage. And so if you're paying attention to those numbers every single month, you're going to see those go up and up and up. And hopefully that answers Lee's question. That's a little bit of insight as to why that happens. Yeah, Lee, uh, Lee had actually... Um, said that he, that's what he was asking, right? That he knows that you manage 3,500 properties and does the inventory just keep growing? Sounds like the answer is yes. The inventory largely keeps growing, correct? Mm -hmm. That's oh, the biggest proponent of it. I mean, we do, we do work with owners that just bring properties to us to manage, but that's a much lower number. That's, you know, 150 a year that we bring on that way. Whereas we buy 700, build 400 a year. And, and that's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest add to our overall properties under management is because we do it internally. Got it. Got it. We got a couple more. We got a couple more questions on the private lending side. Mike Foster's asking, Greg, do you have a sense of say 10 to 15 year longer term investment profits of JWB's 10% lending program versus purchasing JWB's turnkey rental properties? I do. I do. Um, it comes back to looking at historical data based on appreciation. And what we see is that over market cycles, real estate appreciation in certain metros tends to repeat itself, all right? So if you go and you look back at, and I know Mike, he's a long-term client, right? He's in the Atlanta area, right? If you go back and you look at what the historical appreciation rate is for the Atlanta area, um, go all the way back, go over 25 years, you're gonna see a, a number. And I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you also look at the last, 20 years, what you're gonna see is that that number is largely the same, it's very close. I happen to know what the numbers are in Jacksonville. If you go back all the way since 1991, which is when the Federal Housing Finance Agency got really good with their data and their reporting, all the way till today, Jacksonville's historical appreciation rate on average each year is 4.3%. And if you also look over the last 20 years, roughly, I, I ran the numbers from 2001 to, to, to today, the average appreciation rate is just over 4% as well. So the, the, the theory here is that if you invest for a market cycle, which is known to be between 10 and 20 years, a full market cycle, supply and demand just works so that unless there is a huge shift in how an economy works in a certain area, you're gonna see that same historical appreciation rate play out or very close to it. And that's a really key takeaway. Because if you can count on home price appreciation, then you should be factoring it in to how you make your decision of what area to buy in, right? As rental property investors, you have a few different markets out there that you can invest in, right? Jacksonville is known to be a growth market. 4% appreciation for the last 20 years is much higher than the national average. If you go to some of these other markets in the Midwest, it's much lower. I tend to pick on Cleveland a lot because I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan and we always talk trash on Cleveland. And Cleveland's home price appreciation rate is about 2.3% over that same period of time, right? So it, it, you would be better served by investing in a market that is known to appreciate more once you hold on for a market cycle. So I got a little sidetracked. I know Mike's question is relating to private lending and home price appreciation, uh, private lending and owning rental properties. But if we know that over a market cycle, and Mike asked between 10 to 15 years, right? A market cycle generally is known to be between 10 and 20 years. That if you buy today and you hold on for that market cycle, you're going to see, call it roughly 4% on average year over year appreciation, right? If you compare that to private lending, private lending, you're gonna earn a 10% interest rate, no matter what the market does, you're not gonna earn more than that. 
right? That is a set it and forget it. It's a set interest rate that you're going to earn every single year, right? And it, it compounds annually, but you get what I'm saying, right? 10% each year is what you, what you earn. If the real estate appreciates, it doesn't matter. If you buy rental properties and you in, you're in for a market cycle and you get that 4% uh, on average appreciation, think about what this does for your overall returns when you use financing, all right? When you use financing, let's just keep it simple. Let's say that the market value of the property you're buying is $100,000, right? So 4% appreciation of that means that that, that value goes up $4,000. It's now $104,000. You got $4,000 of return in that example, all right? But if you use financing and you only put down 25%, the amount that you put down was 25,000, excuse me, it was 20, yeah, $25,000. So a 4% gain is not on that full $100,000. It's only what you put down. So that gain is actually, you know, 16%, right? Because you only put $25,000 down. So that $4,000 gain is, is much higher than 4% gain. Okay, so this is why, especially buying with leverage, if you hold on for a full market cycle, you're gonna see much higher returns when you own the asset than if you just do private lending. That is, that is the key why it makes sense to do that. Okay, so there was, there was a lot there, right? Um, Lee Bishop puts plus the cash flow as a bonus, right? I, on, a, on a more simple, on a, if we were to deconstruct that more, right? Long-term private lending, 10%. That is unquestionable. After that, I know that you don't like to speculate on appreciation, but historically, the investors that have purchased turnkey properties, it sounds to me that they're closer to like that 12 to 16%. Is that kind of, oh, those seem to kind of be like the range of, of numbers in there? It's, it's hard to answer that question directly because- We've been serving clients since 2006 and the market has changed dramatically mm -hmm. in, since 2006, right? When the market tanked in 2007 and eight and nine and 10, you could buy properties at 35% less than what they were earlier and probably 45% less than what they are today, right? But rents didn't drop. So your returns that you could get if you bought, if you had a crystal ball and were buying in 2010, on cash flows were a lot higher than what they are today, mm -hmm. right? It's just, that's the reality of it. So it's, it's not a fair comparison. I could just give you a simple yes, that there are many clients that have gotten those returns, but it's not a fair comparison because the market offered that type of return specifically on the cash flows at that moment versus today, your returns are between seven to 9% right? Based on what the market is offering. Prices on the happen. cash flow. Yes. Just on the cash flow. Okay. Seven to 9% just on the cash flow. Okay. So, okay. Then, so then I hear that and I think, okay, seven to 9% on the cash flow, add that 4.4% of appreciation. If we can count on appreciation, which you don't like to speculate on. And we're talking about 11.5 to 13.5 kind of percent. Really Not exactly though. Not exactly. Okay. So I don't like to speculate, but I'm going to do it because you asked me to, right? It's good to see, tell pe people the, the full picture of why I love using smart debt to buy rental properties in a growth market. Okay. So what you're talking about is a seven to 9% return today based on the, the cash flows and based on tax savings and based on principal pay down. That's how we get to that seven to 9% return. But that's also assuming that you're using conventionally financed purchases. Okay. So with a conventionally financed purchase, when the market value goes up and appreciates, you get the full appreciation because you own the asset, but you also need to take into account what you put down because that's how you determine what your return is on your investment. So a simple way to look at this is that if you have an asset that appreciates at 4%, but you only put 25% down, just from appreciation, that's a 16% return on your money. 
So if we wanted to paint this picture of what the real potential is to own rental properties, and you're never going to see this on a property evaluation with JWB, because I don't know how long you're going to own it, right? I'm telling you to own, own it for 10 or 20 years. If you don't, you might not see this, but the full potential here and why I sing this from the, the rooftops all the time to buy and hold for a market cycle and to use smart debt is because you'd actually combine both of those two numbers. It would be seven to 9% from the cash flows and the tax savings and the principal down. Plus a 16% return from appreciation has been proven historically. So it would actually be 23% to 25% you follow this plan and saw this all the way through and held on for a full market cycle all right so you you we haven't even we haven't talked about that we've been doing the show for how long now and i've never mentioned that because i i don't like to bring people on with an expectation that you can earn 20 percent in this and yada, yada yada but that is the full picture that's what got me so fired up to buy 40 rental properties and quit my other job that i had back in 2006 and to start to build this income producing portfolio it was because I could invest in something that pays itself every single month, brings positive cash flow, and also if I just stay true to this model and hold on for a market cycle, 10 years, 20 years, the returns are better than what you're gonna see in a lot of the other asset classes. So there you go. I'm glad you broke that down for me, Greg, because you've always, you know, you've always tiptoed around these, the, these lower numbers. I've never really dug that deep into it, but I've never heard you say 20%, right? Like that's pretty eye opening. Um, and again, not to be, I think I know which clip you're going to, you're going to break down from today and just blast all over the internet. If I, <laughs> if I know you correctly, it's going to be that you got You got to pair that one down. Uh, Cause we don't, we don't want people coming here uh, solely basing it on appreciation, right? Th those 20 some odd percent returns I was just talking about, the vast majority of that is from a creation and that is dependent on you following the model and doing, doing what we tell you to do, which is to hold on for 10 or 20 years. If you're only into it for five years, I don't know. It, it's not going to be 20% plus, right? So that's why we, we scale it back. We go way more conservative and we only talk about the cash flows, tax savings and principal pay down for that seven to 9% return because that's in our control. No matter what the client does and when they sell, that seven to 9% return is what I know I can show up with and deliver. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Speaking of, speaking of things that you can control, uh, this is a quick question. Jared Denton asks, what is the minimum required time frame for private lending? That's a great question. So the, the minimum term is three years for private lending. So you need to be prepared to have your money tied up for three years. We do often pay that back ahead of time um, because we typically build and sell properties a lot quicker than three years, but we like to have that buffer just to make sure we're under promising and over delivering. And we make annual payments to private lenders. So if you lent $100,000 after one year, we would make a payment to you. It would be equal to $10,000. And then the next year, we would make, after the second year, we would make another payment to you equal to $10,000. And then on the third and final year, if it went all the way to maturity, you would get one final payment in the form of $110,000, which would be your principal return to you plus that last year of 10% interest. Great. Great. And, you know, we're coming up on 26 minutes. I know that usually this is scheduled for half an hour. We generally go over, we're going to go over again. We like to under promise, under deliver, over deliver at JWB. Uh, real quick for anybody that only had that timeline. Uh, I just want to encourage everybody that if this is your first time on, you want to get some more information on the fundamentals of all of this stuff, go to jwbwebclass.com watch that thing. Greg and I put that together. Greg delivered it. I think it's really, really informative and it'll, it'll, it'll really add a lot of value. And then you're signed up for that client newsletter and you get to, you know, keep up with all the, all the value that we put out there. And then if you want to know how to private lend, you want to get in on that program, or you want to know, maybe you want to uh, get some information on uh, rental income properties that is personal to you, go to chatwithjwb.com. You pick out a time to, um, to, to connect with our team and it'll be a largely informative uh, value seeking call uh, to just kind of get to understand your needs and tell you what we think. So I encourage anybody to go to those things. So now, Greg, we have a couple of more questions, but I wanted to, this, this tails into thinking of these two returns and thinking about success in investing. I wanted to get into a question that we had from, from, from this week, which is, what is your opinion of the, of the greatest determinant to rental income property success? 
Yeah, and anybody who was in the group and saw my walk and talk yesterday, I was pretty passionate about this, right? What most people don't realize is the single greatest determinant to your success as a rental property owner is how long your resident stays in your home. Many people focus on a lot of things, right? There's a lot of important decisions, right? Your, your property manager, your market, the numbers of the house, you know, make sure that it's built without you know, maintenance issues and things of that nature or renovated. With, those are all really important. But what most people, what, once you've got the right asset in place in the right market, the most important decision for you is how long is that resident going to stay? And put it to you this way, right? I come from the assumption that you're going to hold on to these things for a full market cycle, 10 to 20 years, right? All those other things, the, the market, how much you paid for the property, your initial returns, how it's built, how it's renovated, all of those you need to get right, like right off the bat. But then after that, you're going to hold on to this thing for 10 or 20 years. And so this concept, this theory, and this strategy about keeping people in your home long term is going to be a much more of a determinant for you because it's going to be for a 10 year process, right? You need to align your resources and your strategy to keep people in your homes for a very long time. And the reason why this is the greatest determinant is because if you look at how returns are broken down, and we do this for clients, we have our, our own client ROI report, which breaks down clients' returns every single month, every single year. We see how trends work. It's much like how, you know, a stock performance, right? You can, you can track how it does over time. Well, we do the same thing with rental properties. So we know exactly how it works. And what happens is when your resident is living in your home, your maintenance costs and your vacancy costs are a lot lower than what we told you to expect. So you're building up this surplus. And what happens is you're building up this surplus, building up this surplus. And then when that tenant moves out, you give some of the house's money back. You know, you, you, you have a couple thousand dollars that you have to put back into the property, right? And you got a couple months of vacancy, call it, you know, to be conservative there. So, but it's not like if your resident left after one year, your cost to put the property back into rental shape would be a lot lower than if your resident stayed for five years. Like, you know how this works. It's generally about the same amount of costs on average, right? It's general wear and tear. It's, you know, flooring and paint and blinds and stuff that's going to need to be done. If somebody lives in there for one year or for five years. So if you can come up with a strategy to only have people leave every three years or every four years or every five years, you are going to save yourself tens of thousands of dollars on maintenance costs and vacancy costs. And that's my strategy. So we realized this, I don't know, like five years, seven years ago. Well, we realized it a long time ago, but five years or seven years ago, we, we sort of got the courage to do something that nobody else was doing in Jacksonville for sure. And I don't know if anybody else was doing it across the country. Um, we said, we're not going to sign one year leases anymore. We said, we're only going to sign two and three year leases. And we went into this with eyes wide open, knowing that this was going to decrease the amount of homes, the conversion rate for our homes, right? We were going to have to spend a lot more money on marketing. We we're going to have to spend a lot more money on staff. We we're going to have to invest a lot in systems to be able to handle this because, you know, people at that point were expecting to rent houses for one year. And it was, it was hard to kind of train and retrain the renting population. But we did it because we saw the long-term benefits for ourselves as rental owners and the long-term benefits for our clients. And so we did all of that. And what we saw is because we only signed two and three year leases now, we've increased our average duration of tenant stay to over four years. It goes up every single year. And over four years means that you only have one of those times, you have four years of building up a surplus now. And then at the end of four years, now you take a little dip and then you go back up, right? And that's how we're able to win for a returns calculation for our clients. We're able to perform at returns. But Pablo, I'll tell you, the other thing that really matters to, to clients is like, there is somewhat of an emotional part of this investing decision, right? You know, if you're like me, I don't like spending money on my own house, right? I can't fix anything in my own house. Like I got to, I got to pay somebody to do it. Like, Right now I have an ice maker in my patio outside and it's just like decaying because I just, I don't want to buy, I don't want to spend money on it, right? Like it's not fun to spend money on a house, right? Well, think about this, doing this for a house that you don't live in, that somebody else lives in, 
right? There's just something about it. Like, piss off, right? You don't want to spend a couple thousand dollars on it. So if you can avoid that and make that happen once every four years, you're going to have a much happier client, right? You're going to think about this. You're going to have a smile on your face when you talk about your investments, um, as opposed to what keeps most people from investing in rental properties. You ask them and they're like, well, something else broke in the house, right? I got to fix this or my tenant just left, right? Those are those emotional components. So by doing this, by signing long-term leases, being committed to it, we work a lot harder because at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot better, get happier with your client, and then you're going to come back and you're going to buy more houses from us. That's been proven over time. That's how we can all win uh, together. So that's, that's the strategy. Awesome, man. Awesome. And, you know, you said something in there. Right? You, you mentioned the emotional pain of the tenant leaving for the homeowner. I want to dig into the business decision of when you decided to go from one-year lease to three-year leases. Because I know when you swim against stream in an industry, that is a lot of emotional pain as well, right? So can you kind of talk me through that process, right? When, you, when, you, when your eyes got open to maybe we should try this, to getting what I would imagine is overwhelming feedback from people telling you you can't do this, to you and your partners making the decision we're going to go forward, to then realizing it's working. Can you just kind of talk me through that? Yeah, it was, it was not an easy process. There was the risk of us to do this um, as a business. You know, we, we run a property management company. We cannot let the number of houses that we rent suffer because we want to make a, a big stance or take a big long-term gain, right? We can't, we can't let the short-term success falter. And so as we went into this many years ago, right off the bat, every other property management company here locally and across the country told us that you couldn't do it. They told us that you couldn't do it. Like nobody would want to sign a two-year lease or a three-year lease. But more than that, they came up with reasons or they thought were reasons. Really, they were just excuses as to like logistically why you couldn't do it. We had some very uninformed property management companies out there tell us it was illegal to sign a two-year lease or a three-year lease. That was not the case. But one of the things, one of the hoops we had to jump through early on was that because this was very new to the marketplace, you actually had to have multiple people notarize a lease in the beginning in order to make this happen. And so it, it created an extra hurdle. You had to have somebody notarize something, which meant the tenant had to come in and we had to have multiple people sign off on multiple notaries and all this other stuff. So it wasn't that it couldn't be done. It was just like everything else that I'm gonna share with you about signing longer term leases. It was just harder work. And so that's the way it was in the beginning. Um, and so, but we overcame that hurdle. It is not required to do those extra hoops of you don't need to get it notarized now. I don't know when that changed, but that changed a little while ago. Uh, and so now it's just that it's just harder work. But I think what's really important for people to be asking themselves is if, if what you're hearing from me makes sense and longer term leases make so much sense, why has this not caught on more? Right? There are a million property management companies out there. You don't see anybody else there signing out there signing two and three year leases. Why, Pablo, why do you think that is? Because of, and I'm cheating, right? Because I understand this a little bit, but the business model of the property management company is uh, they get fees on the turnover, right? So they are de-incentivized to create the long-term wealth of the client themselves if that is the way that they're making money. Exactly. The, how much, and this, I haven't prepped you for this one. Let's see if you get this. All right. Yeah. All right. So we, I own a property management company. I know how the books look, right? How much of a property management company's revenue do you think comes from tenant placement fees for a typical tenant, property management? Tenant company? placement versus just management fees? Yeah. If they looked at their books every single month and they saw how much income they earned as a percentage of their overall revenue, how much do you think comes from tenant placement fees? I don't know, 50%. It's almost there. You know, 25 to 50% is very realistic for a property management company. And so if I went to you as a property management company and I said, hey, I really believe in long-term leases. I want to bring my properties to you for you to manage them, but I only want you to sign long-term leases. What I would be saying to a standalone property management company out there is that I want you to work twice as hard, but you're not going to earn that tenant placement fee income every single year. Now you're going to earn it every two or three years. So you'd be asking them to take a huge pay cut, right? So it's not just that property management companies don't want to do this. They don't because it's a harder job to do, but it's not just that. They can't afford to do this as well because they wouldn't make enough money to support 
their business. And that's why I keep coming back to this thing. My, I'm a big believer that the reason why more people aren't investing in rental properties is because of the property management model and the goals not being aligned. And this is the biggest and best example I can, I, can, I can put out there that we all understand if you are a rental property owner, you know this to be true, right? You want your tenants to stay there forever because you know that your returns are gonna be better if they stay there forever. Well, we would think that a leading indicator of them staying there forever is signing long-term leases, right? If you only sign one-year leases and you want people to stay four plus years, you're just hoping, you have to resell them on it every single year versus it just, just happening, right? So if we all know that, then it would stand to reason that property management companies should do this more often, but they can't. And it's because a large portion of their fee structure comes from tenant placement fees and they just can't, many could not afford to do it. Um, at the end of the day, the difference between a standalone property management company and a turnkey provider like JWB is that the majority of our income comes from home sales. It is not from tenant placement fees. We are willing to forego literally millions of dollars of tenant placement fees that we could earn every single year. If we only signed one year leases, we forego that because we're hoping to make it up and more than that in home sales. And so that's a good thing for you because the only way you're gonna come back and buy three, five, 10, 15 properties from JWB is if our returns are exactly what we told you they were going to be. And if your service is what you expect and we can blow you away with, with mind blowing customer service, right? So that's how, that's the shift that we've built our company on. That, that's a shift in strategy it's completely different than if you go at this alone, you buy a rental property yourself and you go and find any other property management company out there. They're not going to be incentivized to sign to keep residents long-term. And ultimately many times that results in a less than positive experience for rental property investors out there. Makes perfect sense, man. Perfect sense. I, you know, I look, when I, when I hear you describe that, I think of my previous career in the construction industry and the difference between a, I used to, we used to build hospitals and, and universities and whatever. And, and there's two types that would do it, right? Like one, one, one type of construction company is a construction manager and a general contractor. So an owner would have to hire a design team and a construction manager. And those two teams would always kind of go back at each other. When something was missing, there was some kind of fight between the two and the construction manager will hit you with up for more money because the design team missed something. And the design team would say, no, that is just like their schedule is off. And that would create these inefficiencies. Whereas if you go with a design build firm where design and construction is in-house, kind of like Haskell here locally, mm -hmm. you don't have that issue because they're controlling the whole ecosystem. And to me, from everything that I've learned from JWB, that that to me is that, you know, this is just a small sample of it, but the idea that, that y'all are completely vertically integrated from the, from the moment that you buy the land to build a home, to put in the, the tenant, to, to then manage the tenant themselves, it just, it, to, to me, it makes perfect sense that you're able to, to take away all these inefficiencies in the whole life cycle of it um, for the benefit of the consumer at the end of the day, man. So that was, that was really well explained. Exactly. I mean, you, you, I love how, you know, you're not a real estate guy. I think that's one of the big values of the show, right? I mean, that's why we, when we were putting this thing together, we're like, man, this is going to be awesome that you're going to ask me questions that, the, that are going to speak for the audience, right? So, I mean, what you're talking about there with, with the example of a design build versus kind of a la carting it out, right? You have one phone number to call when there's a problem, right? I think they also say, you know, you have one throat to choke, Right. You know, yeah. if something's yeah. not going right, that's a yeah. little bit of draconian there. But, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you have one one entity that's responsible and the expectations that they set in the beginning are followed through. And so if you can have that in the in the in the, the building construction world, it makes your life a lot easier as yeah. as an owner. Yeah. Same thing applies in property management. But, you know, it's this entire rental property game that has been missing that. For, for, for years. I mean, if people know, you know, there's millions of books written about it. They've been talking about it for decades, how owning rental properties is an incredible asset class, but it just hasn't been easy for people. It's the reason why, like my dad, who I love and I listen to his investing advice and all that good stuff, right? There's a reason that he never owned another rental property prior to me starting this. He never owned another rental property and his only house that he ever owned was the one he lived in. 
and, it, and he had books on his shelf that talked about why you should be investing in rental properties, but he didn't do it. And it was because it was hard to do it. And there were many, many teammates that were required before. And there were many, many opportunities for ex excuses, you know, and pain. And so he went down the normal route of investing in the stock market, stocks and bonds and mutual funds for his entire life. And then, you know, I was able to see the light here through, uh, you know, many wonderful, lucky, you know, scenarios here, getting to have some great mentors, putting this wonderful team together that we have, being in the game now for over 14 years. And when I saw the light, he saw the light too. And he's like, oh man, why would I invest in bonds when I could do this type of a thing with rental properties, right? Do I really need to have my entire portfolio in the stock market and have it susceptible to huge variations? Let me go a little bit slower and steadier and put it into something that's more consistent like rental properties. But he wouldn't have done that if he had to do the work himself. Makes he would have known that would have been better, but he still wouldn't have done it. And that's what's been holding people back. And that's, yeah. that's what we're here to serve. Yeah. And that's echoed in, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go a little bit more into rental, rental properties here because, you know, even Everett uh, Shapiro, who is another one of our regulars, we very much appreciate him as well in the Facebook group, put in private lending is a do it and forget it. Rental properties, even with property management are much more complex as discussed vacancies and repairs, liquidity issues, capital gains, all affect cash flow and returns. Rental properties are for the more savvy investor with a longer window for investing. He then clarifies that's not a question he's just saying, and that good job by, by what we're doing, right? But it brings me, it, 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 I, you know, that, to me, that's clear. And to me, it's clear that the mission that JWB has embarked on, and in my opinion, is executing very well, is to simplify that process, right? And that's illustrated by this, this whole vertical integration of it. Yeah, that's a great segue to, to checking out that web class that we put together. Pablo was a big, big, big uh, help with that web class. I think it was, our, it was, our, it was our baby together. Brother. It was, <laughs> that web class was, uh, was pretty awesome. I would highly encourage you, if you haven't watched it, go do that. It's called how, how to invest in rental properties without the headache. It goes into what we're talking about here and, and then to a whole nother degree with a whole bunch of examples that'll help kind of shine the light on this. Uh, but it's a great place, especially if this is one of your newer, new, the newer people here on the call. It's a great place to start. Definitely. And so Greg, now I'm going to challenge you to explain something that I think is going to be hard to explain without graphs and charts. And I know that we've talked about maybe having a full call about this, but Victor Scarpula, who's here with us on this call, asks, can you please show me how you get to seven and nine percent cash flow if you buy something for $175,000, rent it for $1,250 with a 25% down payment? I don't get it. So is it, do you think you can talk him through that? I can talk through it and I'll also give you a, a great resource to follow along so you can actually see the numbers as well. Um, anybody can go to our website and request to view properties and we'll send you evaluations right then and there that are going to show you exactly how we get to seven to nine percent. So the website is jwbrealestatecapital.com. It's front and center right there. Um, so I would highly encourage you to do that. You know, what, what you're going to see is that that seven to nine percent is assuming that you're getting conventionally financed purchases. So, uh, part of this is the loan that you're getting, right? So, what the way that we do this is we take your rental income, your gross rental income, right? And then we subtract out what your mortgage payment is. Now, lumped into your mortgage payment, there's generally your taxes and your insurance, right? So, we include that in there, your property taxes I'm talking about, and then your homeowner's insurance. So you got rental income up top, you take out your mortgage payment, which is your PITI, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. We assume that you're putting down 25% and we, um, we, I think we assume a 4.5% interest rate right now to be a little bit conservative and it's a 30-year loan. Uh, at that point, we also take out your expected maintenance cost and your expected vacancy cost. And this isn't just a guess. Since 2011, we have tracked every dollar in and every dollar out for our clients and for our own properties. And we know exactly what our maintenance costs are. And as you would expect for new construction properties, they're really low, right? So your maintenance costs are 4% of your gross rents that are collected and your vacancy costs are 2% for your, of your gross rents collected. Because that's what we have demonstrated since 2011. So anyway, so you take out your maintenance and your vacancy component, then you add in 
some of the things you might not be considering, Victor. Maybe, maybe this might be why I didn't make 100% sense for you. Um, you add in your principal pay down and you add in your tax savings. Principal pay down is pretty easy to understand, right? Your resident is paying down your loan for you every single month. And so you can just run a simple amortization schedule and out of your mortgage payment every single month, a portion of that, like 150 bucks in the beginning, is your principal pay down. Right? So your loan balance is going down, right? So that's a, a benefit for you that's happening. And then your tax savings. So what many people, and I did a walk and talk about this last Friday. So if you want a little bit more insight into this, you can go into the group. It's jwbfacebookgroup.com. Uh, and then you can see a little bit of a more detailed breakdown into how the tax savings work. Um, but basically what the government allows you to do is to depreciate an asset like rental properties. And you can do this over 27 and a half years. And that depreciate kind of scares people sometimes because they think appreciation or depreciation, like house value wise, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just the fact that things break over time. The IRS gives you a write-off for that. And so you take the building value that you have, you divide it by 27 and a half. And every year you get that nice sizable write-off. That might be a $6,000 write-off for you based on a typical property in Jacksonville. Well, that means that if you had positive cash flow all the way up to $6,000 and you had the $6,000 write-off, you don't pay any taxes because you normally would have had to pay taxes based on rental income for the year, but you don't have to pay it when you throw this depreciation write-off there. So ultimately that will probably generate about a $1,500 tax savings for you somewhere around there. And that is a component of those seven to 9% returns. So overall, again, you got rental income, subtract out all of your expenses, including maintenance and vacancy, including your property management fees. I forgot to add that. We take that away. Um, and then add in your tax savings and your principal pay down. You take all of that and you divide it by your initial uh, down payment and your closing costs. And you'll get to seven to 9%. That does not include property appreciation. Property appreciation is just a bonus on top of that. Um, you'll, you'll just see seven to 9%, even though there is much higher upside. Nailed it. That was good stuff, Greg. Good work. Uh, Victor puts thanks, Greg, here in the chat. Um, Mike Foster has a great question here. For tax reporting, does JWB provide turnkey real rental property owners an annual list of all incomes and expenses for each property? Yes, we do. Absolutely. Uh, it's called your Schedule E. And uh, it's very simple. It's a normal thing that we do every single year. It's very easy for you. At the end of the day, you can take just the reporting that we give you. If you do your own taxes, you can use it yourself or you can just hand it to your CPA and it's got everything that you need right there for you. Don't you also have a portal that, that uh, has some information? Can you talk about that? Yeah, we, we also have a portal called our client ROI report, which is something you're not going to see from any other provider that I know of. And I know pretty much all the ones in the game here in the country. Um, many years ago, you know how I was referencing it since 2011, we've tracked every dollar in and every dollar out. Well, it's not just for us to know what our maintenance and our vacancy numbers are. It's to hold us accountable so that we're actually hitting the returns that we estimate for clients when they buy a property. Because, you know, for most people who buy rental properties, you get excited about what your estimated returns are the day that you buy it. And then if I ask you one year later, how are you doing compared to your original estimates? you have no clue what your original estimated rate of return was. You know, there's just not, it's just not easy for you to, to track that. It gets somewhat complicated. So we do all that for clients and it's through this client ROI report. And so Pablo, you've, you've kind of seen it a little bit, right? You see, so basically every single month, you're going to be able to see what your rate of return is, right? You're going to be able to see how much rental income was collected, what your principal interest taxes, insurance payments were, what your property management fees are, what your um, maintenance costs are, right? Your vacancy costs are included there as well because your rental income would be less if you had a vacancy and you're able to see your tax savings and your principal pay down. And that's all there for you to see. And we update this monthly. So the power of this is two things. You get to learn about how to successfully build a rental property portfolio because the numbers are there. And when I talk about this surplus that you're getting by having a house being rented for many, many years, 
right? The reason that I know that is because I've, I've known of my own properties, but I see it in this client ROI report and you would see it too. Your homes are rented, you're, we're gonna be overperforming most of the time, right? And then the year that that tenant moves out, we're gonna take a dip momentarily, right? It's not gonna be a great year for you, right? For just that one property. And then it's gonna build up again, build up again. So anyways, that's the first really big benefit. You, you just get so much insight into how to actually construct a well-performing portfolio. And the other really great thing is for you to be able to hold us accountable and hold yourself accountable to your rates of return. I think it's really refreshing when I'm putting my money with somebody and not only just tell me what, what returns they earned today, they tell me, what did, I, what did they tell me I was gonna earn when I started to invest with them 10 years ago? And how have I performed lifetime since that 10 years, right? It's that instant accountability and it's front and center there. And that's the way we love it. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, a, that's available for all of our current clients. That's great. That's great. And listen, I, I failed to mention, you mentioned the Facebook group earlier. We haven't mentioned that all day today. We do have a Facebook group. We have over 1300 uh, investors in there inside that Facebook group, clients, friends of JWB. Uh, if you want to keep up with us throughout the week, Victor, it sounds like you got a bunch of great questions and you want some good information. Uh, go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. Join us. Greg goes live in there in the mornings. Uh, you know, that's, it's our cool club. So you're invited and everybody that's on this, on this call is invited. Um, and I also wanted to uh, point out that, you know what? I lost my train of thought there. I'm going too fast. Yeah. I'm sure it'll come back to you uh, <laughs> or maybe not. You know? Oh, you know what? I got it. I got it. I just want to invite everybody for Tuesday's call, right? We have an amazing guest on Tuesday. It's Dan Merrill from uh, Fortune Builders, the founder of Fortune Builders. He has built a real estate empire himself. Greg and him go back a long way. So it should be a really insightful education and all things real estate. You're able to ask him questions personally as well. We're going to try to get through as many as possible. Um, you know, this call, we, we had a lot of questions. I haven't been able to get to all of them. Right. But we keep track of everything. We have people reach out if you don't have any, if we haven't gotten to it. So we'll continue down that path. So I really want to thank everybody for joining here this week. This has been a great call. I'm going to ask one more question and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Glenn Scott Friedman in the Facebook group, which we've just previously mentioned asks, how do you expect the forbearance issue to affect the real estate market, Greg? How do we expect the forbearance issue? So I, there's a couple of different, you know, I guess, reverberating effects from this, right? Um, the forbearance is, uh, issue for those who aren't aware is basically under the CARES Act for anybody who has a federally backed mortgage, if they display a hardship, they're able to have a forbearance which basically means they cannot make payments right now. And then they can basically add that to the back of the loan. And so this is according to the website, you know, uh, Freddie Mac's website, they estimate over 50% of mortgages out there are, would be subject to this. So, you know, what, so that's a large portion of, you know, most, a lot of investors out there are affected by this. Um, not every investor is taking forbearance. So I think the, the first big question is how prevalent is it? You know, what we're seeing here at JWB is that, you know, our rent collection numbers are really high, right? In April, our normal rent collection was 98 and a half percent. And on, in April, we were at 97 and a half percent. So we were 1% off in the throes of coronavirus before the actual stimulus plan came to be. Um, and so if you're not having a hardship, it doesn't make sense for you to go on to forbearance. Right. So I, I don't know what the effects are going to be, but I think we first need to understand what percentage of loans out there are actually taking people up on this, on the, uh, taking the government up on this forbearance option, because the forbearance option does not come without some downsides. And this is a, an issue that is still evolving. So you're going to need to pay more attention to this than just what I'm sharing with you right now. But as a part of the CARES Act, the intention was that if a borrower, right, if Greg, had a hardship on my property that I could go and ask for forbearance so that I wouldn't need to make the mortgage payment and that it wouldn't negatively affect my ability to get a loan. What we're seeing actually happen is that while it's not affecting my credit score, and I, I haven't done this by the way, in case anybody's asking, <laughs> this, is, this isn't something I've actually done, but I'm just using me as an example, right? It wouldn't affect my credit score, but it would show up on my credit if I went to go and get another loan. And lenders are not lending again to somebody who is in a forbearance. They want to make sure that you're paying your loan 
before they give you another loan. So, and this is really just coming to light. It's such a fast moving situation that, you know, it's not just like this free way to just not pay mortgages for a long time, right? It's incentivizing borrowers to be able to pay, you know, unless they really just can't afford it. Um, and so I don't know how many people are going to take, take up on it. Um, I think in a worst case scenario, if a huge number of people, uh, investors and homeowners take up this forbearance option and you do not have a significant improvement to the economy towards the end of this year, it could have really big effects because, uh, you know, you could get to a place where you could see an increase in foreclosures, which would affect, you know, the housing market and, and all that. So in a worst case scenario, I think this could have a pretty dramatic effect there is so much yet to be determined. I think right now we just keep a pulse on it, right? We need to see how many people are actually in forbearance, which I'm sure they'll have data on at some point here in the near future. And then the bigger thing is that we need to see how the country responds after July and into August, because that's where a lot of the stimulus money and the unemployment money runs out currently. And we need to see what the status of the economy is at that point. So it could be a bad thing if nothing goes right out of what I just said there. It could not be uh, much of a difference if um, not a lot of people are on forbearance and the economy improves to a point where people can support their payments. So yet to be determined, but you know, it's something to keep a pulse on for sure. Okay, I had no idea about any of that. So I, thought, I found that very, um, very illuminating. And we're coming up on an hour. This is, you know, this is as far as we go. Um, I want to thank everybody we've had. We went half an hour over. We still have 19 people here with us in the Zoom call. We have, uh, I don't know exactly how many people on Facebook, but we've had like nine or 10 people watching this whole time. I see Everett's watching right now. Thank you everybody for being with us. Greg and I really, really enjoy doing this. We enjoy when, when people are with us live. We enjoy interacting with you in the group. I suggest that you uh, take part of all that stuff. Again, if you want some more baseline education, you want to learn more about all these principles, go to jwbwebclass.com. If you love the principles, you love what you're hearing, you want to get some personal advice, go to chatwithjwb.com and it'll be really, really helpful for you. Um, and we hope to see you on Tuesday where at 1230, we will be interviewing Stan Merrill from Fortune Builders. It'll be another great conversation. Take a bunch of Q&A, have a bunch of notes here of people to follow up with and we'll do that as well. And Greg, I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the platform to you to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I want to tell you that I'm super excited about next Tuesday's show. Than is, he's a riot, man. Uh, and if you want to hear about what life was like for me when I first got started, Than was my mentor in the very beginning. And he's like my big brother in real estate. I guarantee you he's going to make a lot of fun of me. And I'm going to do my best to make fun of him on Tuesday. Um, it's, it's really a, an honor and privilege. And it's going to be a lot of fun on Tuesday. So I highly encourage and hope you all will be there Tuesday at 1230. You can go to jwbshow.com. You'll be able to register there. And uh, yeah, man, another great episode. Thank you, everybody. All right. See you next week. Have a good one, Greg. Bye.